Hi, MCs. Are you loving the conversation so far? Well, now you can show that love around to your friends. Terry and I have injected our fun vibes and funny lines into statement pieces you can now find in our store. So go ahead and take a look. And if you like what you see, put a card on it. You can visit us at melanatedconversations.com. Check out our store and we appreciate you for your support. This week on Melanated Conversations, we chat with Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson. Dr. Rihanna is an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She earned her PhD in clinical and community psychology at the University of Virginia and completed a clinical and community psychology residency at Yale University School of Medicine. She was also a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow in applied psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Anderson has published dozens of peer-reviewed articles and contributed to a range of print and live media, including the New York Times, The Times London, Huffington Post, Psychology Today, Women's Health, WebMD, CBS, NBC, all of the ABCs, you guys. She is involved nationally and an appointed member of the American Psychological Association's Children, Youth, and Families Committee, the Society for Research and Child Development, Equity and Justice Committee, and the Society for Research on Adolescence Anti-Racism Task Force. Y'all, we had such a good time in this episode today chatting around having the talk with our children around racism and racial discrimination and socialization in black families to reduce racial stress and trauma and improve psychological well-being and family functioning. Welcome to Melanated Conversations. Our narrative and our perspective. Here on the podcast, we are amplifying the voices of black women and sharing their powerful stories of transformation. I'm Tyrion. And I'm Yana. Let's start the show. Welcome back to another episode of Melanated Conversations. I am your co-host, Tyrion. And I'm your co-host, Yana. Yes, and we are so excited to be here today, guys. We have a special guest on the line with us today. We have the incomparable Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson on our show today. Hey, Um, y'all. Hey, (laughs) welcome. (laughs) Welcome. You You, you may have seen uh, Dr. Anderson on all the major news networks, all the alphabets uh, (laughs) on the internet, and she's to chat with us about the work she is doing dealing with racial discrimination and socialization in Black families and all the things. And so we are just going to have a great time today. But before we get started, I'm going to pass it over to Yana so we can get into our game. You ready? You want to play with us, Dr. Yana? We, you know, we like to have some fun before we get into things. Let's, I don't understand what the conversation is. Let's do it. Oh, all right. All right. I like her already. Good energy. Good energy. So I'm just going to throw out one for today. And of course, Terry and I will answer this question to you. I'm just going to ask, what's the weirdest tradition your family has? Who, all right. I don't know if it's weird, but the degree to which we do it is weird. So like playing taboo at holiday events, we have had people get kicked out of the house. We have not spoken to people in years. It's just a level of like, you need to know exactly what I'm trying to hint at. And I'm like, okay, family, sometimes we don't know those things. And it doesn't mean we need to kick people out the house as a result of that, but it has happened and it will continue to happen. So that's, it's not weird, but that, it, it gets intense, y'all. It is a serious thing. <laughs> you might actually be related to us. I was just saying. <laughs> just saying. 
I, Dr. Dr. Ann, I don't know if you know, but uh, Yana and I are actually first cousins. My I dad, did not. Okay. Yeah. So my dad and her mom are brother and sister. So um, we know all about the weird family traditions things. And ironically, that is a huge one. <laughs> taboo. We don't play about taboo. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would have to say, Yana, I think maybe, so our, ugh, this is weird, but our grandmother, every Christmas, I know what you're about to say. Since we were kids, she always during Christmas time, she always would play. Um, is it Chuck Berry's Run Run Rudolph? Is yeah. it Chuck Berry? Yes, yeah, Chuck Berry. Okay. Have you heard that? Do you know what that song? I don't think so. I'm okay. It, it got famous off of Home Alone when they're running, when the family's like running through the airport. Anyway. Okay. okay. So she does this little, I don't even know, little step touch dance, and we would all join her in our Christmas. Uh, sweats and whatnot um, and do that. So that was like a weird thing that just kind of carried on. It's like it, whenever we do get together for Christmas, it's not Christmas. It's so we hear Run Run Rudolph is played. Yeah. And we have yeah. to have the, all the grandkids had to wear their red um, sweatsuits. Yes! Every <laughs> single one of them. There was like nothing Christmassy on it. It was just a plain no, red sweatsuit. No, we had to wear the Christmas tree turtleneck underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Facts, facts, big facts. What about you, um, Yana? I was going to say, so Terry and, our, and well, Dr. Yana, our family is a little on the, I won't say crazy, but a good crazy, a good crazy. Yes, we like yes. to have fun. And we're not having fun if, you know, we're not joining one another. Like, well, I guess, for, I don't know, the region, regional term for it could be playing the dozens or, you yes. know. Yes. <laughs> So, and honestly, when we bring guests in, if, you know, if you're not in the mix, then, you know, you probably, we, we probably, you know. We probably don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and but it's we're like not joking healthy. around with you. Yeah, <laughs> it's like healthy, like, dialogue. I mean, it may be, I don't know, is it healthy? We're talking it's to a therapist. Love. We might tell us some things. <laughs> might be like, <laughs> Y'all are classified. Your family. No. <laughs> like no. we, we are, we are, uh. <laughs> We're contributing to people's trauma. That's right. No, no, it is building healthy resistance and resilience that they can use in the real world. That's how we might think of it, you know? Yeah. Educate us. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that would be mine. So, yeah, I, I like all of those. Thank you Those's for playing answer. around with us. Yeah. Yes. So, oh. we don't want to waste any time today, guys. We really want to get into this melanated chat today. Yes. So, Dr. Anna, my first question for you is simply just who is Dr. Anna Elise Anderson? What are your roots? Can you just share a little bit of your backstory with us? Yes. So first and foremost, y'all can definitely, we can just go by Rihanna or even Riri because to know me is to know, uh, I have many nicknames and and Riri is one of them. Um, But I would say, yeah, to know me really is just to know about Detroit. Like if if you know anything about Detroit, if you um, have met a Detroiter, we are incredibly prideful people. We love our city very much. And we will fight to the to the bottom of the map just to say, like, you're not going to disrespect us. You're not going to talk about any of the problems we have, because that's like an in-house thing. Like you can talk to your family about it, but you can't talk you know, about it uh, to other people. So we, we are very prideful um, people who really just love our city and, and love it fiercely. So that's like a major takeaway for me. I, I say that I am uh, born in, raised for and returned to Detroit. And that has been a a theme for me throughout my life to know that everything that I do was because of my city and everything I will do is for my city. And and those are the some of the ethos that drive my work to this day. I'm someone who very much so uh, loves fiercely. I I love my community, friends, family so much. Um, And I love black people in a way that um, it, it just Everything that I do at, at the heart of it is, is for the improvement of our well-being. And I think the last tagline I'll say is that throughout my work, um, I've had this focus on acknowledging that Black lives matter. So the, the movement is absolutely important. And as a psychologist, I actually beg the question about Black life mattering as well. So the quality of the life that we lead and we live has to matter as well. We can't just say 
that folks need to be alive because if people are alive and facing disparities and, and in inequities that are um, shortening the lives that we live or shortening the quality, reducing the quality of the education or the income or um, our, our general health and well-being, then that's not a life that I would want to live either. So I, I always support this idea that Black life matters as well. And that's who the heck I am. Yes. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that. And uh, and I was just going to just say one little tidbit. Your love definitely shines through your work. Uh, if you aren't already following her get your life it's <laughs> a mover and shaker in our <laughs> world um but i was gonna talk about so can we talk about this fighting against feelings deep within when you know it's the right move so i read in a former interview that you telling the story of fighting the call to return back home to your roots mm. so like, what was the defining moment for you that prompted your return to do this work where you wow. grew up and how has the decision shaped your mission to serve? Ooh, all right. I'm not going to try to cry on today. That My goal is not a midday cry, <laughs> but um, yeah. It's okay, so, it's okay to cry because they're going to yeah. let you go. I'm the crier on the show. You so sure I, is. Well, let me get my tissue. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. <laughs> we did well, cry count. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We are family then. We are related. Excellent. excellent. Um, you know, so I, I, we were talking before the show about the, the life of an academic. And I think a lot of people, when they hear the word professor, shoot, even I, when I was in undergrad, I had no idea what a professor was or did. And I just thought all they did was, was teach all day. And there are certain um, schools or certain levels of, of uh, being a professor that that might be the case. In my case, I, I'm uh, very research intensive and research heavy. And so when you're applying for positions or jobs, people will literally apply everywhere. And I always throw Iowa and Idaho under the bus. I don't mean to do that. But honestly, just in my life, there would never be a moment where I would say I desire to live in the great state of Idaho. No shade. Just saying. That's just my experience. So uh, when you think about academics, they they apply up, down, left, right, middle, big, you know, it, just any institution to become an academic because it's actually really quite hard to get our um, positions um, oftentimes. So I'm, I'm sharing that because um, God really graced me and blessed me when it was time for me to look for a job with a variety of opportunities. And some of them... Uh, fit this like Goldilocks model of, you know, too close, too far, just right. Like I had, I had really the, the, a bevy of opportunities, but within that Goldilocks model, there was home. So there was University of Michigan School of Public Health. There was this like dream oasis of University of Southern California out in LA, like, you know, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then a third school, um, which I won't share at, at this moment, but I had this opportunity to, to really, Think about, do I want to go all the way out there, this place I've always wanted to be, L.A.? I wanted to apply to USC when I was in undergrad and couldn't afford it. And now they're telling me that they're going to bring me out and pay me like, wow, what a full you know, circle moment. Or do I go back home to a place where I know in the depths of my spirit I'm supposed to go? And when I was making that evaluation, I thought to myself, well, if, if God is giving me the opportunity to go out to L.A. and God knows the desires of my heart, then I have to take this opportunity because I don't know when I'll, I'll have it again. So I chose to go out to L.A. to, to be a professor at USC. Um, and, and again, in the same way that the academy is a hard place to get into, it's also shrouded with politics. So I'm not going to talk in depth about what was happening at USC, but I knew quickly that it wasn't the right place for me. And I was so confused. I looked up to God and I said, didn't you tell me to go out here? Isn't this what I was supposed to be doing? I prayed, mm -hmm. I fasted, I asked my pastor, I did all this. Like, wasn't this, and, and you, and you gave me the desires of my heart. Isn't that what you said you wanted me to do? Um, and so to answer the, the question on how I knew I needed to come back, there were two really pivotal moments. One, was that I came back for one of my best friend's weddings in Detroit um, in October of that year. So a few months after I moved out and just being home brought actual tears to my eyes. I was, I was just 
aching to come home. And again, this was October. This was a particularly like dreary and gray weekend. And here I am living in LA with like a little drop top, you know, sports car, <laughs> living downtown, drinking juice, doing yoga, like everything I've ever wanted to do <laughs> right, in my life and feeling unfulfilled because I wasn't working on behalf of, of Black families the way that I knew I could have back at, in Michigan. Um, and not being supported in the way that I needed to do to, to launch my career um, the way that it needed to go. So that was moment one where I, I physically just felt a pull back to uh, Detroit. And the second was a um, sermon at the church that I was attending in L.A. And I tried to do this super quick for you. all But the sermon was um, the, the pastor asked. Who here considers themselves an entrepreneur? Now in Los Angeles, California, that is 93% of everyone because they're like, I'm my manager, I'm my agent. I, you know, they're everything for themselves. So all right. these hands flew up, right? <laughs> but then I started thinking about it like, well, you've at this point created this uh, therapeutic strategy for Black families, and we'll get into that later. But you've created this program called Embrace you essentially have developed a logo. You have to hire a staff. You have a website. You 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 have made a business um, unknowingly, right? Like you don't in in the academy, we don't talk about it like that. But I unknowingly created a business. So I was like tentatively raised my hand, and then the pastor asked, <clears throat> "What did God tell you about that dream of being this entrepreneur early on? What what was the dream associated with this?" And a flood of memories just came back in about how <laughs> in the third grade, I drew this picture of something called the Kid Dome. And it was an inner city Detroit children's center that would serve the Black children in my community that I worked on this vision with the Detroit City Council as a high school student, interned with the council to, to create this place, mm -hmm. had, had said I was going to come back and do this. And somehow after you know, eight years of the academy, hopping from place to place, getting trained and, and you know, learning how to do this work, I lost sight of it. I lost the vision. And that day I walked out of church saying, I have to get back to Michigan, you know, come heck or high water. Like I, I got to get home. Um, and again, God showed out by allowing me to take a job at the University of Michigan, the place I had declined the year before and these jobs don't just come up, right? They're, they're not like yeah. bountiful. They, you know, once something closes, that's that. So it had been filled, um, but God created a, a job. And the person who gave me my job, my, my chair of my department said, this has your name on it when mm -hmm. she offered it to me. She said, it's not an open position. If you take it, it's yours. If you don't take it, it's no one is feeling this. This is yours. And that language that that God has spoken, you know, in to to people who follow, you know, the word that when something is yours, it doesn't matter what you have done. You could have fallen short time and time again. You, you could have made a mistake. You could have um, declined, as I did, you know, an opportunity. But if something has your name on it and if it's yours, it is yours. Mm -hmm. And coming back home has opened up a world of opportunity and, and has launched me in a way that you would think staying in LA would have like being close to media and being able to, to be on camera. Like that is what I thought was going to happen out in LA. And I thought being home in Detroit was going to stifle that opportunity coming back home. Wow. <laughs> That's just an amazing story. I, I think God sometimes in his sovereignty, you know, he can, he has things already laid out and planned for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just so funny. Do you, have you ever thought about the fact that maybe the only reason you went to LA for that short season was for you to be in that seat that day for that pastor to bring back for, for those memories to flood, flood, yes. flood you again? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And once I recognized like you had to go there to come back here, like once mm -hmm. I, I learned that storyline, things started to unlock. Like I, it's a longer story than, than it, we have time for today, but sure. after I was praying and fasting and I wasn't hearing anything from God, I'm like, you just like, how are you just going to leave me to go to LA? How are you not going to talk to me? I don't understand what's going on when God and I typically have a very communicative relationship. Yeah. But after that service, after that sermon, after my 
understanding that I needed to come back. God told me three things like that were going to happen in a given week. They all happen. And it made our connection stronger to say, like, I will never leave you. Never. Mm -hmm. You don't even know how much I protect you and cover you because if you really want to see what bad is, I I will remove my my protective Mm -hmm. cover. Mm. If you want to see what it really looks like, but you, you experiencing a bump or a bruise or a, you know, a, a storm, um, is not me not covering you. I'm always yeah. there. So that's what that was. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You have ministered to you. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Cause this actually wasn't a plan, but it, it, ha- it was, it was, it was, it, it happened the way it's supposed to happen. So yeah. I'm so grateful of you sharing this story. Yeah. I'm going to just, <laughs> it I don't want to cry. We but, don't mind ever having church around here, no, but it is, it is, it is quite interesting. We were not expecting to have church today. Uh, in well, we can, moment. we can, Thank you. listen, we can <laughs> stay, <laughs> but it, you know, that is, that is something, right? Cause you know, folks in the Academy definitely don't talk about God. Like you don't hear about what mm-hmm. God does, uh, to researchers yeah. and academics a lot. So that that is something that I am very clear about, like the the impact of God on my life. So thank you for giving me the space to talk about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah. Love that. Love that. But let's talk, let's talk about the work that you have dedicated yourself to, um, which evolves around the study and impact of racial discrimination and socialization in Black families. Can you share with us uh, your experience growing up Black and how that influenced uh, you, if at all, uh, your decision to pursue this particular topic of, in your field of studies and work? Yeah, so I, I always like to just uh, reverse this a bit because when we talk about socialization, I think that's just like, what? Now, what is this word that y'all are talking about? Like, what is this thing? Um, colloquially, we call that the talk. And it's it's perfectly timed because um, as we're taping this, the last night, the debate um, had a question from a Black, black moderator on the talk and, mm-hmm. and why that should be something that folks engage in. And we saw a range of responses to that, which I'm going to leave at the side of my table. I will not bring it up today. But anyway, we've got folks who have conversations with Black children about the discrimination that they are expected to face in the world around them. And that's this idea of socialization. So for me, um, growing up, even though we we got a taboo, strong family, we also have a very Afrocentric family um, who talk quite a bit about what the joy is first and foremost of being black. So having a strong foundation in culture in pride of uh, our people knowing who we are and what our capabilities are. And also very clearly pointing to some of the challenges that may um, come at the, the ex- quote expense of being black. So I, I as a mixed woman, um, biracial woman growing up in Detroit, had a very interesting bird's eye view into two different communities. And I've always called myself the bridge. Um, I'm someone who has learned how to navigate not only in those two worlds, but between those two worlds of, of black and white, and now as a researcher and community member. So someone who chose to come back to Detroit and now lives, you know, 45 minutes or an hour away from her university, but is making a very clear decision to be in spaces where you have to to know how to navigate what is actually happening to people. Not to say that you can't live on a, you know, in a college city, but like, I want to know what experiences folks around me are having um, in the same way that when I was growing up to, to know what it was like to um, face discrimination when you didn't even fully grasp what discrimination was. So one, one, <laughs> one thing that I think about all the time is the plexiglass um, in between, you know, consumer and the, the, the tellers at corner stores, right? Mm-hmm. So I grew up like, that's just what it was. Like, th- if that's the only model that you've ever seen is that you got to put your money through this little thing or this, you know, you put your foods through this conveyor, you know, I don't know, lazy Susan, you know, device, like you're, you're, you're trained to know that this is what the world looks like. And you don't know that it doesn't look like that for everyone until you leave that world. So again, I I would go to 
maybe my white father's side of town or, you know, um, when I've left Detroit and, and lived in different cities, I've seen like, oh, there aren't bulletproof glass dividers in between everybody. Yeah. That's not a, you know, it's not an expectation or something even, you know, someone pointed out on, on Twitter recently about like the products that are locked up in certain maybe CVSs or whatever, like, you know, hair products mm-hmm. or um, <laughs> condoms, things of that sort, that there's a concern around what people are going to take. Th- those everyday discriminatory experiences were things that we faced all the time growing up in Detroit, but didn't have the word or the understanding for when I was growing up, but I faced it quite a bit. And again, because I had that the, the dual life, I, I was able to, to navigate these different worlds. I, it brought this acuity for me very quickly that things were very different depending on which parent I was with or which, which side of town I was on. So those were some of the experiences that helped me to think about how do children who experience these barrage of negative experiences and and resources that are deprived from them, like how do these kids navigate the world and how do families play a role in that navigation? So that's a pretty like large scale idea of, of what drove me to think about the type of work that I'm doing today. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I like the way that you, you, you frame that because, you know, the talk it's, it is, you know, and, and most people, when they think of that word, the talk, they think of something different, but it is something that in black communities, that's, that's just something that just happens in general. Our viewpoint of like the black experience and things and preparing for what life may be like for us. So goes into my mm-hmm. next question on our show, Terry and actually, and I have had several conversations around this kind of ideal around race and talking to our children, mm-hmm. have different experts on raising anti-racist children to transracial families. A lot of things that we hear is that these families don't necessarily have the, the talk. They want to opt out of this dialogue with younger children due to exposing them too early. That's such a thing. Can you share from right. your you know, aspect, mm-hmm. your psychological viewpoint and everything, and even your exp- personal experience, how this form of overprotection of avoiding this conversation or the work around this topic can impact the child and how this possibly can contribute to un- unhealthy patterns, you know, as they continue to grow up. Yeah. So I, I typically um, think about it. It's the, it's in the same spirit, but it's a, a slightly different way of getting to it. So we talk a lot in my work about this idea of airplanes. And you might ask what on God's green earth does an airplane have to do with what we just talked about? Well, back in the day when we could get on flights, I don't know if you remember those times, but when we could get on flights, um, you were told as soon as you were about to get off or take off what you needed to do in case the uh, plane uh, was going to a fiery crashing death. And I I always thought to myself, would I be engaging in those practices that they told me to do uh, while we were calm and confident, or would Mm. I be screaming up and down, you know, the highways trying to figure it out. But there's a reason that they tell you what to do, even when you're calm and even when you're about to zone out and not listen to this, this person giving you this, this instruction, there's a reason that they tell you, what to do every single time to keep you safe. So the work that we do actually has, has pulled out some interesting statistics. In the year 2019, more Black people were killed at the hands of police officers than who died in airplane crashes worldwide. So in the United States, wow. more, black, yeah, more Black people were killed at the hands of police. And that's one system. We're talking about police only. We are not talking about things like the novel COVID-19 pandemic that's Mm -hmm. certainly going to be a a factor this year. We're not talking about um, freezing to death in a home because you didn't have uh, air conditioning or, or excuse me, heat Mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, facing your death because of of, uh, not having air conditioning. We're not talking about any other system. We're talking about policing only took more black people in one country than uh, airplanes did the whole of the, the, the earth. Mm. I share that because we think it's okay to talk to people about safety precautions every single time they get on planes worldwide because we know that it keeps people safe. And yet we want to try to use the argument that we don't want to talk to our kids about race, even though it happens at a more frequent racial incidents that take life 
happen at more frequent rates than do the, the thing that we're prepared to talk about every day um, or every time we get on that plane. So the, the, that's how I get to it. And, and the way that I talk about that then is that it, that's a misnomer. It, it, stress research teaches us that you have to expose people at least incrementally to the stress or to the stressor so that they know what to do with it. You would not say, let LeBron just go ahead and play next year. He doesn't have to warm up today or practice today. You would never say that. You would not say, just get on a plane. And when it goes down to a fiery crash, you'll figure out what to do about it. That's not what we would say about highly stressful situations. We know that it's important to expose at least to some degree um, so that people know what to do with it and know how to cope with it. So that's, that's what racial socialization or the talk is all about. We're going to expose, we're going to tell kids the truth. We're going to do it in a, de- in a developmentally appropriate way. So no, you're not going to want to tell them, like give them Alex Haley roots when they're five years old. That doesn't make sense. But you also don't want them to get to where they're experiencing interpersonal discrimination and racism, because again, they're already <laughs> facing it, right? They're facing it every day. They have plexiglass in front of them when they go to the store. They have schools that are um, underfunded. They have houses that are not close to the, the resources that they need. They're already living in racism from utero. Mm. So we're talking interpersonal discriminatory experiences that can happen to them starting, you know, very early on. We don't want that to be their first exposure to it because your child is going to essentially be in a fiery crashing plane, not knowing what to do. Mm. Mm-hmm. This is good. <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> also, the fact that we don't have the talk just one a time. Lifelong, and correct. 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 It is a lifelong conversation. Right. It yes. really, really is. Yes. Constantly having these conversations. I was having this conversation with my children last night. Exactly. And had no intention of it, but my child brought up something that they learned in school yesterday and it took me down a whole <laughs> path. My husband's like, they need to go to bed. And I was like, let me finish. <laughs> I need to get this off my chest because no. We, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. That just took me so. Oh no. Y- y- listen, yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that it, it is. It's a constant wow, man. You wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. This is so so good. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go to the next question. Oh, thank you, y'all. This is great. Yes. Okay. So I want to ask you about um the, the program that you developed that you mentioned earlier, Embrace, yeah. which stands yeah. for engaging, managing, and bonding through race intervention. So can you explain to us what is the purpose of this program? program and what is your hope for this program? Yeah, so um, there is this idea. So so I've been talking about research a lot and I'm also a, a licensed clinical psychologist. So there's a thought that um, sometimes all of our worlds don't speak to each other. Sometimes research exists in its silo. Sometimes practice exists in its silo. Sometimes teaching exists in its silo. The goal is to integrate all three of these things as, as much as possible. And again, I was sharing for me, it's even a maybe the lens by which we look through that also has to be authentic. So I can't come at it from somebody, someone, not necessarily from a different background, but I certainly if I'm not living the experience, if I don't have the community telling me things that I need to hear and and supporting it, then it's going to be all of that's going to be inauthentic. So the idea was, how do we take what the research has been saying for decades now. We have over 40 decades of research on this. How do we take these 40 decades of research that having the talk is a good thing? And here are the things that people typically say when they have the talk. We know all that information. So what do we actually do about it? So as a psychologist, are there psychological practices that people are engaging in to help Black families in particular, but really all families to be more competent around this issue of of race and racism. So um, one of my academic travels took me to the University of Pennsylvania to work with um, Dr. Howard Stevenson. And that last name may sound familiar if you um, know the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. That's his brother. Okay. okay. So essentially that that household is just a powerhouse of people who really think about race and what to do about it. So Brian in law and um, Howard in psychology, and they're they're both, you know, giants uh, respectively in their field. So I was working 
under the tutelage of, of Howard, who had already developed a number of these practices in the Philadelphia community. And we kind of whetted our interest of, all right, I want to see families talking about this issue um, competently with each other. I, I want to see how we can create a, an intervention or like a, a therapeutic approach is another way of thinking about a program, right? Like to address these things. And I want families to be the experts in this case, because they are like we, we as therapists can only encourage through strategies, but like, you're the expert, as you just said, right? Like you're talking to your kids, you know, the content you're, you're the one who's in that house um, having those conversations. So we want to support and respect what it is that you're doing. So, yeah, so that's how Embrace came to be. We, we took all of these ideas and actually it's always funny because I forget about this sometimes when I share the story, my job as a fellow was just to start to develop this idea. Like I had two years where I was supposed to just put ideas together and like create what it would look like. Oh, wow. So that after I left the fellowship, I could, you know, start testing it. Man, within three months, one of our school partners was like, so y'all gonna like do this with us? And we're like, <laughs> no, because that's not how research works. And they were like, no, nah, but that's what you got to do. So it, it, it was this beautiful moment of when those silos came crashing down. You can't just have research. You can't just have practice. You just, you know, can't just have teaching. You have to see how those things work together. So even though it was a bit premature and it was not something that I necessarily was there to do, I heard what the community was saying and responded accordingly. So we uh, kicked off a few pilot studies there and just gleaned so much information. I'm going to quickly do a plug. I know that by the time folks listen to this, it, it may or may not be time to vote. But I I do just want to say this one thing. I was writing a blog earlier today using data from those pilot studies in Philly. And these Black children are telling you outright how afraid they are of certain presidential candidates who were Mm -hmm. also running in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what they would do to these kids. And, And they were right. Like, if you read what these kids are saying about they're not going to be treated well. They're afraid that they're going to get kicked out the country. Like it's terri- mm. it's terribly accurate, terribly accurate with what their fears were in 2016 manifesting to today. So I really just want to encourage people to understand that these children are so clear and clairvoyant with respect to racial issues. And those racial issues are, are on the ballot. They are also playing out in local politics and, and local yeah. um, policies. And so I just want to encourage you all to, to understand that your, your children and the children around you are not blind to uh, the things that are impacting them and, and yeah. just to be mindful of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Get out and vote. Yes. <laughs> please, please. And while we're kind of on, we're in a kind of general area of that, I want to actually talk about something that has kind of, let me just be blunt, has irked me okay. here, was that, can we address this notion that racial sensitivity, education, oh. and critical race theory is Come racist? On. Yes, ma'am. Please, please lay it out for us. <laughs> How can we push, you know, we're, uh, we, we are fighting, we're, 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 we're fighting a fight. <laughs> to already be seen, heard, just there's so much resistance when mm-hmm. you're already just trying to push just to be seen as an equal and just mm-hmm. to and, and to break that down. Now we got to fight to even teach these concepts. I mean, I'm just as frustrated and irked, so I I, I share in that um, that frustration that you're you're just saying there. Um, I know that y'all are Southerners, and I don't know if this is a Southern phrase or just folks with Southern families that have been using it. I don't know, but a hit dog will holler. And that hit dog will I say that all the time. <laughs> a, a hit dog will holler. If if you call people or things racist and they recoil, just be mindful that they are reacting to the term because something is resonating with them. If someone were to call me an alien, I would look at them and, and be perplexed, but I wouldn't recoil. I wouldn't yell back and I wouldn't be frustrated around that. I would simply say that's inaccurate. Right. 
So people who are being told that they individually or that their culture, their country, et cetera, is a thing and they are hollering and they are actively working to, uh, to unearth and, and to unwork some of the progress that's been made in that domain is just letting you know what they are. I am not concerned, though, I, I will say I, I just submitted a, a large grant last week about racism. And, and according to the executive order, the federal government cannot fund me, given what I wrote about. My, my prayer and my hope is that by the time my grant is being um, evaluated, that executive order will be rescinded. But to to say that things like critical race theory or anti-bias uh, workshops or, or discourse can be taught or uh, provided is akin to, and, and we'll call this, we'll call a spade a spade on this. This is akin to 1940s propaganda from Hitler. It, it is the exact same, <laughs> it is literally the exact same strategy that socialists were using in Eastern Europe in 1940s to deprive people the ability to learn and to read about historical bases of, you know, where folks are or to, or to advance themselves. And eventually when you saw those books being burned, that deleted and erased an entire mindset, an entire way of, of being so that any person who thought that way is now considered the other or the enemy. Th that is what is being used. That same propaganda strategy is being used now. And I, don't, I actually don't think it's too strong to make a parallel between what we saw in the Holocaust to what we're seeing today. Like it, it is a very similar strategy. A lot of people have written about it and I, I'm not one of them, but um, there's very clear evidence of the parallels between the shift in uh, tyrannical autocracy and mm -hmm. and leadership that the sitting president is using relative to what Hitler used. So, so that's what I'll say there, that we, we are riding a wave of very terrifying propaganda that is meant to prevent us from learning and doing what's right. But at the end of the day, it's because these dogs that are being hit are hollering. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then can I add to that? I think it's also uh, the, the irony. I think some of the loudest dogs that are hollering right now <laughs> are the ones that are uh, sitting in the quote unquote church um, mm, are, wow. I feel like are the loudest right now. And I mm. have a problem with that. I have a huge problem with that because if anybody should be standing up and speaking out against these type of things, it should honestly be the church, yes. but no. We are, the, well, I'm not going to say we, because I'm not part of that church because, but you know what I'm saying? You, you keep the, the church is hollering and calling this thing demonic, which I find it interesting mm. that the very thing that you're calling that de demonic, it really, the things that you're doing to try to twist this, y'all are the ones that are being demonic. You're being used by the enemy to, to cause more division and more nonsense mm -hmm. and, and allowing the lies and things to, to, to be spewed. And God, you, people don't, I think people keep forgetting at some point you are going to have to answer to God mm. one day about the things that you are spewing in his name. It's a mm. problem and it is sad. And I pray to, that God has mercy on these people or that their eyes are open sooner than later, because I, I have a huge, huge problem with that. Like it, like, Y'all talking about being irked, that irks me to no extent that the church is failing terribly in this, in this, in this realm, really, really in this realm. We, we, yeah, anyway. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not an anyway. Let me, <laughs> let me give these two quick resources for folks. Sure. Um, there is a pastor, uh, Mike Walrand, who I am absolutely over the moon for, and, and I'm grateful that the, uh, I had access to him before, but I think the pandemic has given me the the license to watch that on Sunday and to feel yeah. like I'm back in the, the congregation. So uh, Pastor Mike Walrand at First Corinthian Baptist Church has a series of discussions on this very topic that are justice oriented and that, and that relate to the role of the church in speaking out. So I, I highly encourage, and I wish I could think mm -hmm. of the name off top of what the sermons were, but you'll, you will get your whole life if you just spend your Sunday up and down 
that on-demand page for First Corinthian Baptist Church. So that's one recommendation. Okay. The the other is uh, Pastor Eric Mason at yes. Epiphany. Oh, okay, yes. yes. So Epiphany Fellowship in Philadelphia, where I used to go. And yes. he, girl, yes. yes. Woke Church. Woke Church. His whole yes. series on woke church and what the job, what the role of the church is to combat this political apathy or antagonism like it's explicit antagonism of of justice seeking so get your life get it yes <laughs> thank you thank you thank you we will make sure we link um those names and, yes. and everything as well in our show notes i'm sorry uh Oh, okay. One last question. And then we're going to go into our closing questions. I wish we had so much more time. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll make yes. this happen. Yes, yes please. No, we have please. to. We have to. <laughs> have to. Oh my goodness. Okay. Last question. Can you tell us um, about your blog and podcast, Our Mental Health Minute, and how you use this platform to make mental health topics simplified and acceptable, uh, or accepted, excuse me, in a yeah. relatable way? Yeah. So I, I think this really, this has been such a helpful chat with you all today because I'm I'm able to see how so many of these things are interwoven in ways I haven't actually seen before. So this has been great. Um, this, this idea that again, practice, research, teaching all in these different silos, <clears throat> a colleague and I, when we met at a conference, um, golly, a decade ago, are we that old? I guess. Yeah. About a decade ago, um, we realized how much we had in common. We put on for our cities respectively. We, you know, would have been classmates at one institution. Like it was just crazy how much we had in common. But one of the the nuggets of things that we had in common for sure was wanting to make stuff accessible to black folks who would never be at the conference that we met at, who would never read the papers that we are, you know, putting out in our journal publications. So, so these things, we, we, in 2011 or 2010, 2011, when we first met, the question was, well, what's, what's new? What's a fun, you know, strategy. And at that time, you know, YouTube and Vine were really big things like these, you know, making short, fun videos for folks was a thing. So we thought about if we were to work together, what would this look like? And we developed this idea of these short one minute informational videos for people and ended up with the name Our Mental Health Minute, our really to show that we're talking about ourselves within the Black community. And then Mental Health Minute is just, you know, quick, accessible resources. So we started in 2014, 2015 with our pilot episodes, just trying to get this off the ground. And um, it's been an interesting journey. We, we've, we have been able to think about and process what the past five years has looked like for us. But you know, technologies have changed and people are not, everybody now is doing a minute video on Instagram and on, you know, uh, TikTok, like everybody is doing this now. And so the, the market is a bit saturated, but what's been interesting for us is just having the feedback from folks that we, that, that subscribe and who watch us to say, today was the first time I thought about myself in therapy or I got to see what it looks like to be in therapy today. And it's not that bad. I'm going to check out a, a therapist now. And we're really excited that there are a lot of new organizations that have entered in the world that, that are providing resources to, to black people about how to access a, a therapist. And so we're hoping that our niche, our little corner of the market that talks about this is what depression looks like. This is what it, you know, it feels like and looks like. And we'll, we'll do a skit around it. So it's not just informational. It's, it's uh, entertainment. <laughs> it's information and it's entertainment. So you get both in a minute or two long video. Um, we also recognize when we lived a thousand miles plus yeah. apart, maybe a video isn't the best thing to do. So we started a, a small podcast. So you can get this information in in about 10 minutes. And we try to jam pack it with the perspectives um, that these two clinical psychologists trained really well at some great institutions can bring back to the community for free and for um, a, a greater level of accessibility than our, like our publications would afford. Yes. I love that. I love that. I love what both you and CT are doing and your, <laughs> Thank you. your interactions and how you, yeah. how, how y'all make it so relatable. So yes, you guys check that out. That'll be in our show notes as well. It's called our mental 
health minute minute. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, going to our closing questions. One thing that we always ask our guests on the show is if they um, have a power word that's guiding them for the year. If you can think of one word, what would that one word would be for you for 2020? Mm. Now, you know, I can't do a word, but I could do a, a baby phrase, like a two word <laughs> phrase. If that's okay. <laughs> uh, this goes back to the, the question around how I made it back home. So the, the, the phrase is promises kept. Mm. Um, and I'll very quickly give a, a story to that. So in March, uh, I likely had COVID. Um, I did not have accessible testing at that time because this was the very start of it. And they were telling all of us to stay home if we weren't um, needing emergency care. So lost taste, smell, was on the couch for weeks, just like struggling. And it felt like my superpowers had actually been zapped from me. And this is me, someone who was a giver, who loves to you know pour into communities and, and to give tirelessly and was needing stuff from other people and and felt very useless at that time. And I really asked God, like, at the top of 2020, you told me that these things were going to happen. You like, I mean, we had talked about CNN, we had talked about all these things. I was like, you told me that these things are going to happen. I don't understand why you are making me sick, why we're seeing death, like why I can't do my research, because that got stripped away, like all these things just just stopped. Um, And in the midst of storms and in the midst of sickness and illness and in the midst of incredible loss came this reckoning from God in my life that continued to show me that the promises can be kept despite everything around you. Like it does not matter what anybody else has going on around them. It doesn't matter what the world looks like. If God told you that something was going to look a certain way, it's going to look that way. And you got to Hold on to that promise. So um, it is October and there are things that I had not thought that were going to happen for me for years that have already happened. It, it, there are things that I was told that would happen, you know, throughout the year that have already happened. So one thing that Pastor Warren at First Corinthian has said is that y'all are looking at 2021 to fulfill the promises and to to see what's next, but there are still several months left in 2020 and God is not done with this year. Pastor Warren also says, you think God looks at a calendar. You wrong on that. So I do want to also just be mindful that like, (laughs) there's no calendar that can bound what's for you, but you also need to be mindful that you're counting yourself out for this year. And there are still, there's still time left. So I've just seen what God has done for me in these 10 months. And I'm, I'm blown away that God can continue to do what God said they would do, um, even right. in the midst of, of storm yeah, and pandemic. You keep preaching to us, and I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love right. it. Yes, God does not operate inside of time at all. Uh, no. And nope. he keeps his promises. You read his word. He's got a pretty good track record. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Do you have any works uh, or any new works coming for us in the remainder of 2020? Anything new you got coming up? So, okay, 30 second update. So because I thought I wasn't going to be able to do anything, I was like, well, heck, I'll just do all these things. And now they're all coming up. And I'm like, that was silly. Like you're, that was real silly of you, Rihanna. So um, I have a a few different studies with um, parents and just kind of gauging how they're feeling and how they're doing in the midst of these times of some on adolescents. Uh, of color in particular to see how COVID and the the racial uprisings have impacted them. Um, And the good news is I will be able to flip Embrace online for our families in Detroit starting in January. So we will be continuing with that work too. So I will be a busy little beaver and um, that's what's up. That's what's next. Yes. And what's the best way our listeners can connect with you? I love me some Twitter. So you could hit me at Rihanna Elise on Twitter. Um, if you have 10 fingers and you spell out Rihanna Elise, <laughs> that's that's the best way to get there. R-I-A-N-A-E-L-Y-S-E. Um, that's that's me. If you hit me on Instagram, I will never respond. But yay, feel free to do it because I know that's what people <laughs> like to do. And then my website is RihannaElise.com. 
All right, y'all, we'll have everything linked in our show notes. And we just want to, again, just thank you again, Rihanna, for sharing in this space with us. We really, really, truly enjoyed our conversation with you. Thank Mm -hmm. you for saying yes. It's my pleasure, family. And now we get to that taboo game for Thanksgiving. I'll be there. (laughs) Yes. All right, y'all, well, we got to go. We got to wrap. But um, until next time, melanate on that. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed our chat today. Keep the conversation going by heading to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leaving us a review. Have a story of your own to share? Email us at info at melanatedconversations.com or connect with us on social media at Melanated Conversations. Till next time, keep raising your voice. MCs, Yana here, and I have a special gift for you. I've had so many of you reach out regarding podcasting and how to know if podcasting is for you. Well, I've created a free guide just for you with what I consider the fundamental five questions you should consider before starting your show. All you have to do is visit freepodcastguide.com to get your copy on the house. I hope this makes your 2020 just a little bit brighter. Just go to freepodcastguide.com. That's freepodcastguide.com. Now melanate on that.